The city is alive with activity. You know Hi, I'm Dave Evans, and welcome to 999. NYC Media knows everything about the city. I know you can take us with you everywhere you go. Our new iPhone app has tons of information about places to eat, things to do, and much more. Download the NYC Media app from iTunes and discover New York. This week from New York Times TV. A former Times employee gets a surprise 40 years in the making. Movie critic A.O. Scott explores the marginal world of show business. Reporter Frank Bruni struggles with a Riesling. And our city critic Ariel Kaminer takes a spin. These stories and more from the New York Times. one of the new and pretty cool T3 scooters. It's an electric device, doesn't produce any emissions, it's got a teeny tiny rolling carbon footprint, and the New York Police Department has just bought a bunch of them to use for patrolling the subways. The police Department likes these because they've got a bunch of great features. They're very energy efficient. They've got a zero turn radius. They can turn in their own footprint. They set the officer a little bit above the crowd, but not so high that the officer is then inaccessible. And they can go up to 20 miles an hour. This is the new T3 scooter. What I want to know is, does the police department like them because they have all those nice features? Or because they're basically really fun toys that attract the attention of everybody on the street. and thinking of getting one for yourself, bad news. They cost several thousand dollars and they are not legal for street use in New York City. So you have two choices, move out of town or join the police force. Straight ahead, when a lost wallet is recovered, so are the memories. Sometime around 1968, I lost my wallet. I got a phone call in 2010, and he says, is your name Rudy Russ? And I said, yeah. So he says, I found your wallet. Wow. This now, is like, a lot of memories for you. I feel like I'm in Egypt, in one of these, uh, or in the catacombs. I'm New York Times reporter David Dunlap. Like Rudy Resta, I worked at the Times when we were based in this building. The grand staircase was where? Right here. Mr. Resta was an art director in the promotions department. Eight years after he retired, the Times moved out of this building. Some 40 years ago, when Times Square was a very different place, Mr. Resta put his wallet in his jacket, which he hung in a closet. So going out to lunch, I took my jacket and my wallet was missing. And I was sort of heartbroken. Fast forward to 2010, the interiors of the building are all torn up. Jose Cisneros, a security guard, found Mr. Resta's wallet lodged in a wall. And his co-worker, Rafael Rodriguez, started searching for Mr. Resta to return his wallet. That's all your documentation? Probably. We, we take care of <laughs> Take a look, you, your credit card is fine. <laughs> I 
I thought that the wallet was gone forever. I had some marvelous things in there. It wasn't so much the money, but I had some nice pictures of my family. Oh, it's all right. It's okay. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, my pleasure, my pleasure. I love you for that. Okay. She looks great. She is. Did you see my glamorous? That's why I married her. <laughs> I'm going to take out the pictures. Yes. 1963, we were going to Prospect Park, and she put on a Jaguar stole. Real. This picture was taken in Central Park, and I always loved that. Who's that? This is Christopher. This one here, I think we took on Coney Island. You know the, uh, the 25 oh, yes. cent machines? Right. Yeah, yeah. This is my father. And that was in front of his house. I thought that was the only photo I had of my father, and he had passed away. December 18th, 1965. Nicole Arresta, say. Thanks again, Jose. Okay, my pleasure, sir, my pleasure. If it wasn't for you, there would be there probably another uh, 20 years, 30 oh. years. <laughs>discover how New York real estate can be a three-ring circus. So, two clowns meet in Afghanistan. It sounds like the setup for a corny joke. But this is the comically romantic story of Christina Jelassoni and Seth Bloom, the husband and wife clown team known as the Acra Buffos. <laughs> Theirs is a socially conscious brand of clowning entertaining the children of war-torn lands, places where the Acra Buffos are often the only Americans without guns. We wanted to use comedy, physical comedy, to do educational performances around malaria prevention, uh, landmine awareness, because theater, visual theater, is a very good way of conveying a message in areas where there's not much literacy. Their professional chemistry soon became something more. It kind of dawned on me one day, like a little bell went off my head. I said, we're clown partners, we're good friends, I could spend the rest of my life with her. And she's like, there's no way we're getting together, uh-uh. I can find a boyfriend, but a clown partner? Uh-uh, they're so rare, I was not gonna mess that up. 30 minutes <laughs> later, she kissed me. <laughs> the couple married in China in 2007, the bride in a gown made of white balloons, the groom in a traditional Chinese wedding suit, They've traveled the world together ever since, in mass growing stilts, spreading silliness and laughter. But they always make their way back home to New York City, to their apartment slash rehearsal studio slash clown gear storage center in West Harlem. The building on St. Nicholas Terrace is a co-op for middle-income families with a cap on how much buyers can earn. We were renting for cheaper across the street, but when it came opportunity to have an apartment that we could have rehearsal in, a little more space in, we said, let's go for it. All of this stuff is portable, so it can fold up, and this space can get opened up so we can rehearse. Now, we can't stand on each other's shoulders because we have a ceiling that's only nine feet. We can't throw triples. Um, but we can at least mock out and mark out a lot of ideas for our acts in this space here. Before the couple moved into the six-room, fifth-floor walk-up, they collapsed three small front rooms into one spacious area and turned another room into a storage closet. Stuff. So Seth does a, b a bubble show, and these are all his, his bubble solutions that he has to mix up. And but no sooner had they moved in than they were back on the road. This is actually We moved in here, and then yep. five days later, we left for Afghanistan to work. We were work. there for five weeks. We were home for three days, and, and then we, we went to Edinburgh for a month. And then we came home for another week. And then we went to China. <laughs> it's amazing, everywhere we go, like, especially when there's usually the rows of the kids right in the front, because they want to be able to see. And to have ah, these, ah, these big, big faces, and then cracking them up, and then the parents are happy that the kids are happy, and it's just, it creates an environment where it is a community, where it is, you've shared something together. 
So two clowns meet in Afghanistan, and the story just kind of writes itself. And now, the minimalist Mark Bittman spices up salad. So I was going to this restaurant, Fetchong Gourmet in Midtown for, I don't know, a couple of years. And every time I went, I ordered this salad. It's the same, time, same thing every time. Pressed tofu and Chinese celery salad. So I asked them to share it with me, and they did. And this is it, and it's got three unusual things about it. Pressed tofu, which you buy, you don't make. Chinese celery, and the best spice oil I've ever tasted. So we'll start with the spice oil because it takes a little while. And when I say spice oil, I mean spice oil. Into a pot, you put a cinnamon stick. Second, about a teaspoon of coriander seeds. Third, a tablespoon or more of Szechuan peppercorns. Have to be Szechuan peppercorns. Some star anise. I'm using four. Three cloves. A teaspoon of cumin a quarter cup of chili flakes. If you want to use a half a cup, go right ahead. But in any case, a lot. Three big slices of ginger. You can certainly use more of that. A few scallions. We got anything else lying around here? Some salt. And for that amount, about a pint, two cups of oil. Peanut oil is best here. And what you're going to do is heat this slowly until it becomes incredibly perfumed and just starts to sizzle. And then you're going to turn off the heat and you're going to let it cool. And when it's cool, you strain it. And as you'll see, you have this beautiful red chili oil. There are some parts of the spice oil that you can substitute or leave out or swap and others you can't. I would not leave out the star anise and the Szechuan peppercorns are an absolute must. What you can do without is this Chinese celery because you can always use regular celery. But there is a big difference between the two. The, the flavor is pretty much the same. Chinese celery is a little stronger. The texture is a little different too. Is very, very fibrous. Very fibrous. And if you chew it up like this, kind of wind up eating a bunch of juice and then spitting out the rest. So we're going to blanch it first, just to tenderize it a little bit. A gallon or so, a couple of quarts of boiling water with some salt in it. During that minute, we're going to talk about pressed tofu, which is called spiced tofu, or called, in this case, soft tender tofu, which it is most definitely not soft or tender. For example, no damage. This is, not, this is not the tofu you're likely to be used to. So you take a couple of these pads of tofu. They're already cooked. They're already spiced. And you just slice them into thin slices like this. This is um, getting there. I want it to be a little hotter. And this, dump it into a colander or strain it with a skimmer like this. The oil's bubbling beautifully. <laughs> what a nice sound. Turn that off. And as I said, let it sit, let it cool, strain it, and refrigerate it. Okay, the salad itself, once you've done all that, is just a matter of assembly. Let's make a bed of celery, a mound of the Pressed tofu. Here's the chili oil I made before. And this is really to taste. And it's, it's strong stuff. Delicious. Strong. So you've got this really firm, not quite as bland as usual tofu. The very celery tasting celery. And the super spicy spice oil. 
You know, may have to look a little for Chinese celery. You're definitely going to have to go to Chinatown for the super pressed tofu. Some of these spices you might not have lying around. This is worth doing a little extra shopping for. It's really cool. Up next, A.O. Scott revisits a movie classic shot in the city, Sidney Pollock's Tootsie. What do you think? Hurry. I'm like, turn around. Great actors reveal themselves by pretending to be other people. Say something. How do you do, Jeff? It's nice to meet you. You look very nice. Just how this happens is the subject of Sidney Pollock's no, Tootsie, no, from a screenplay by Larry Gelbart and Murray Shiskal with some uncredited help from Elaine May and Barry Levinson. You play the tomato for 30 seconds, they want a half a day over schedule because you wouldn't sit down. Yes, it wasn't logical. You were a tomato! A tomato doesn't have logic! A tomato can't move! That's what I said! So if he can't move, how's he gonna sit down, George? Dustin Hoffman plays Michael Dorsey, an unemployable and neurotic New York actor who dresses up as a woman for an audition, identifies himself as Dorothy Michaels, and lo and behold, becomes a soap opera sensation. Shame on you, you. It has some interesting feminist themes, and it's very, very funny, but Tootsie is neither a sermon nor a farce. Hoffman plays Michael straight, which is how Michael plays Dorothy. And this contributes to the sense that Tootsie, in its depiction of the marginal world of New York show business, is not exaggerating very much. I am Michael Dorsey. I am Michael Dorsey. I don't know what to pay off. Well, say it like you mean it. I am Michael Dorsey. Fine. Okay? Mm, yeah. It's not a surprise that a movie about actors should have so many wonderful performances. There's Bill Murray as Michael's roommate, a writer of unproducible plays. I think we're getting into a weird area here. There's Dabney Coleman as Dorothy's sexist boss. Sidney Pollack as Michael's agent, and also Dorothy's agent. There are no other women like you, you're a man! Terry Garr as Michael's acting student and almost girlfriend. Charles Durning as Dorothy's suitor. And Jessica Lange as his daughter, Michael's love interest, and Dorothy's best friend. I really love you, Dorothy. But I can't... I can't love you. Tootsie is about discovering who you really are by pretending to be someone else. But it's also about just how many different people each one of us really is. Sandy thinks I'm gay. Julie thinks I'm a lesbian. I thought Dorothy was supposed to be straight. Dorothy is straight. Les, the sweetest, nicest man in the world tonight asked me to marry him. A guy named Les wants you to marry him? Yeah, no, not Matt. No, wants to marry Dorothy. Does he know she's a lesbian? Dorothy's not a lesbian! I know that, but does he know that? Know what? Did, well, I don't, I don't know. Next, the tipsy diarist Frank Bruni reluctantly explores the world according to Riesling. I don't know that Riesling will ever displace a classic white burgundy in my affections. While I like it, I've never been entirely convinced. Here we are at Terroir Tribeca for a little bit of a Riesling tutorial. I am here with one of the city's most highly regarded, regarded sommeliers, Paul Greco. I'm going to ask you some questions. I have no answers. You're going to provide the answers today. What must be great in there for you to say this is a great wine? I, I veer dry, and Riesling, even at its driest, I sometimes pick up floral elements that, that, aren't, that aren't just what I love. Are you they looking at my crazy? That's yes, Okay. and we're going to get beyond that today. All right, so first up, Helmut Donhoff, 2009 cabinet from the Nahe region. You have to address sweetness up front because Riesling has it. No one else can do with sweetness and with acidity what Riesling can. Observe the sweetness on the tip of the tongue, but what follows is incredible bone-crunching acidity that balances out. Bone crunching? Bone crunching. I don't know that crunching. I'm getting the Back bone crunching. Thing. Well, I mean, I'm getting but acidity, but my bones aren't being crunched. The reason why you don't perceive it as such is because it has residual sugar up front to absorb that. I mean, that maybe, is balance. Maybe a hairline fracture to the bone, but nothing more than that. Can we go in a less sweet direction? Well, now we're going to Alsace. The producer is Joost Meyer, 2005. So this Alsatian example is vitally different than the German one that you had before. The fruit is more mature. Okay, and on the palate? This is dry. What, what, what did you say? 
I said, this is dry. No, I want, this Riesling is dry. There's no sense of sweetness on this wine. This is pure and clean and focused. You should. And dare I say, aren't you that type of guy? You should. You're pure you should. and clean and focused? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not pure, but I'm focused. So our, our third wine, we're going to New York uh, State. Herman Wiemer is the producer. Different aromatics on this one, not the apricot stone fruits that we found on the, uh, the German example. More herbaceous, more delicate, more restrained. At what? Go, go, go. No, no, you brought me from utter Riesling doubt to flickering Riesling belief to renewed doubt with this last glass. You were going to make sure that I didn't have any sort of sweeter candied associations. And the la this last one's tugging me just a little bit back there. Get out of that car or that boat, uh, wherever you are. Yeah. Please, this, we've given you, you've tasted three completely different iterations of Riesling. Riesling can be, simply put, simple and yummy and joyful. So you practice what you preach. Absolutely. You practice all Riesling all the time. Yep. Summer of Riesling, winter of love. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
and I asked her if she would marry me and she immediately started to hyperventilate and start crying. And Amy has asthma, so I actually got nervous that she was really going to need her inhaler. And I said, if you're feeling okay, um, I have something really shiny for you in my bag. <laughs> and I think she started to catch her breath at that moment. And that's when I, I pulled out the ring and I gave it to her.